Um, as Emily said, I'm the director at Kinwell Academy, and we meet over here at JC Body Shop. Uh, Kinwell is, is an alternative school that partners with public schools, and we help out with students who are falling behind due to academics, discipline, anxiety, things like that. Uh, and when uh, College Wesleyan asked us to partner with them and move into their building, we said no at first. Um, Matt Beck, if you guys remember him, and, and Bo Hamner uh, were pushing pretty hard, and I kind of said, no, nah, I don't think we want to do that. It kind of felt like going on vacation with your best friends. You know, I've been going to church here for eight years, and when you go on vacation with your best friends, you kind of, by the end of the vacation, you're like, I don't think we're hanging out with those people ever again. They're crazy, right? And I didn't want to go down that road with the church I love, so we said no for other reasons, obviously. And uh, they were insistent, so we moved in a couple years ago, and uh, it's just, it's been incredible uh, since we moved in. And um, what I, I want to point out to you, uh, we share, like I, I have my mailboxes in the office for, for Kinwell, so I go over there once a day uh, to get my mail, and there's also lots of good food and pastries in there, so I stop in there for that too. Uh, but mainly to get the mail, and I've talked a lot with the staff and I hang out there and, and I've gotten to know a lot of people that work here who I didn't really know before. Uh, and my level of respect has only gone up in the two and a half years that we've been here uh, with them. We have a staff here that I think we should be extremely proud of. Uh, I see all these staff members who are behind the scenes who are never on stage. Their name never gets mentioned, but they've got their lanes that they're in and they hit those lanes with a ton of passion, a ton of energy, with intentionality. And it's been something that's been inspiring for me and how we run Kinwell uh, to see them operate and feed off each other. And they've actually been a good source of energy for me as I, as I pop in there. So um, I wanted to assure you that behind the scenes, what I'm observing, everything is, is incredible for this church. So that's a staff that we should be really proud of uh, and be praying for constantly. So back to Kinwell, um, the primary reason we get a student is discipline issues. A student's often facing expulsion when they come to us. And so you would think that over there would be really chaotic and there'd be uh, lots of fights and turmoil and things going crazy. And there are moments for that stuff. Uh, but if that was the norm, we wouldn't have a school. Um, I would have had a big insurance claim due to injury of some sort, trying to defend off a student uh, and we'd be done. But uh, we're pretty proud of how it's going. And a lot of it has come down to this, the, the themes that we want to create our school around. Uh, and so we started this, this name called Kinwell and Kinwell isn't a big donor who contributed. There's no one named Kinwell that I know of, but it's a uh, name that we created that for a brand that we want to be. And it's two different words put together. The first is kin for kinship. We want to be a family. Uh, so we don't have a rule book that we hand students. Uh, there's not like this uh, big paperwork thing that they got to sign to make sure they follow all these rules. It's just, hey, you're part of a family now. Uh, so that means we treat each other with respect. Yes, we're going to disagree, but we're going to talk through those disagreements. Um, we don't want to kick you out of our family, right? That's not what families do. So we want to make this thing work. We're kind of stuck together now. Uh, so that's the kinship part of it. Then the other part is the well, which you heard here just a few minutes ago. The story of the woman at the well is something that's really stood out to me because there's two people having a conversation who shouldn't have been having a conversation. Uh, one had all his stuff together. The other had some, had some baggage with her. And yet they leave both different people. They both leave that conversation with new life, with new energy. And to me, that's interesting. So as we kind of dove into that, that story as a staff, we started to realize that there is a lot of intentionality in what's going on here. And I'm going to spend this morning kind of breaking down some of the main things that we pull out of that, that story. Um, but it started back in 2012 when I started working in, in this field. And I had a student come to me from uh, Kokomo. He moved... Uh, from Kokomo to Marion because uh, his mom kicked him out of the house because he was getting in trouble at school and things weren't going well there. So she, he had to come live with his grandparents uh, here. Uh, his dad was in prison. He didn't really know his dad at all. And so he started at school. This was my first year. Uh, I graduated from Indian Wesleyan with a ministry degree. So I was really faking my way through the, ed the education stuff uh, and trying to figure this thing out. And we had the student who I didn't really know how to handle a whole lot. When things didn't go his way, it was a big scene. He shut down, he pouted, he got angry. Uh, if he was frustrated with something, he lashed out, really quick to anger. And I wasn't sure what to do about this. We don't have a principal's office. We don't have a guidance counselor. Uh, there was nothing, either the student was with us or the student wasn't with us. That's all the situation had. Uh, and I wanted to keep him with us. Uh, one thing he had going for him was that he was really funny. So when things were going well, he was great. And he also liked sports. So two things I can really appreciate. 
And at the time, Indiana Wesleyan basketball was playing against uh, the Hoosiers when the Hoosiers were number one in the country. Uh, Indiana Wesleyan was not number one in the country, but they were good for NAI. And uh, they were playing, so I said, hey, do you want to go down there with me? I don't want to go by myself. He said, sure. So we had this couple-hour drive down to Bloomington and hang out the game, the couple-hour drive back. But that, that time with him opened up my eyes to a whole different person than what I'd experienced in the classroom. I started, he started to kind of slowly talk about the frustration he had with his dad. Uh, he called it frustration. We could obviously see that it was a lot of anger, a lot of hurt uh, that he had with his dad. Even he felt some senses of abandonment from his mom, wondering why he can't stay in Kokomo where all his friends are. and said he's got to live with his grandparents uh, who have way too many rules for him in, in his view. And I started to see all these things kind of come together. I was like, oh, I see now why you're frustrated in the classroom, right? This stuff kind of makes some more sense. And this conversation I had with him kind of opened my eyes to, oh, there's a whole lot more going behind the scenes of these students who live way different lives than I lived. And it helped shape kind of what we do with students. And that leads us back to the story of the woman at the well. There's a few things, a few things I want to pull out. The first I mentioned is that Jesus engages with someone that he shouldn't have engaged with, right? There's a lot of reasons that they shouldn't have been talking. And I'll let you do your own research and break down the, the scriptures of all that stuff. But you know, we, we hear mentioned in the text that you know, she was a woman, she shouldn't be talking to a woman. She was obviously an outcast from her community being at the well in the middle of the hot day. Uh, Samaritan Jew thing was going on. So there's a lot of reasons that they shouldn't have been associating. But Jesus didn't seem phased by that stuff at all, right? He still went to her and started this conversation because he had a bigger purpose in mind. And Marion is blessed with this great deal of diversity. You have a lot of different races, uh, a lot of different socioeconomic statuses, a lot of different careers here in Marion and Grant County. And I experienced that same thing at Kenwell. And it's turned into this beautiful thing where we have inner city kids from Marion uh, mingling with country folks from Eastbrook, right? And you wouldn't think that would go well, but we've seen some of the most beautiful relationships come from that diversity. And I look at that in my own life and I think I really gravitate towards the people I'm most comfortable with and the, thing, the people I agree the most with. And that's kind of what I pursue. And if I didn't have Kinwa, I don't know that I would have anything else. And I think, man, that's such a shame, right? Jesus engages in this conversation with this woman who can do nothing for him, right? He asks her for some water, but he had a much deeper purpose in that than that, than, than just the water, Right? In fact, I don't think in the story she ever even got him water, so that didn't go well. <laughs> but Jesus knew there was nothing that this woman was gonna do for him to make his life better in the physical sense. Right? And that's often what we kind of guide our relationships around. Oh, this person's funny, I'll spend time with them. Or I really agree with this person, we don't really argue a lot, so we'll, I'll spend time with them. Uh, and that's who we associate with. And we kind of dismiss the people who make us feel uncomfortable or who have behavior that we don't agree with or look different than us or hang around with other crowds. We just want to gravitate to this place that we're comfortable. And what I've learned is that a person's value isn't in what they can do for me. A person's value is only in what they can do for the kingdom. And until we understand what this person's potential is in the kingdom of God, do we feel the burden to press through all these comfort zones that we create for ourselves. We see Jesus do that here, and we see something beautiful happen at the end. But first, she kind of responds with this kind of edginess to her. Did you guys kind of pick up on some of that? I thought Alyssa did a great job of portraying that, of this idea of, oh, you think you're better than Abraham and Jacob? Is that what's going on here? Oh, you're a prophet, okay. Right? I don't know if she got that dramatic, but that's how I see it, it makes it fun. So, but there was an edge to her. And when we experience people with an edge, people who treat us poorly or people who treat us worse than what we deserve, right? We wanna get away from that person. Or sometimes we lash back and try to be even edgier. We try to be a little snarkier. Right? Did you, we don't see that in, in Jesus' response. Instead, Jesus responds with no ego. He responds only with the woman's best interest in mind. You see, it's our ego that wants to defend ourselves. When, we were, when someone is talking to us or treating us in a way that we don't feel we deserve, we wanna defend ourselves or try to create this protective barrier with our words or with distance. And what's that, what that's doing is it's breaking down, breaking us apart from the kingdom of God. 
what I want to challenge you with is don't allow, allow your ego to get in the way of a relationship that could impact the kingdom of God. And as we go on, I'm going to tell you that it's not just could impact, it will impact. Every relationship is meant to impact the kingdom of God. But if your ego gets in the way, you're going to diminish what's possible as an outcome. We see a couple chapters later in John chapter 12, Jesus is talking and he said, unless a seed falls to the ground and, anybody know? Dies. It cannot, I stumped you, multiply. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot multiply. Right? Also, Jesus said to pick up your cross daily and follow me. So those words are talking about something much deeper than dying for your faith, dying for Jesus in a physical sense. He's saying daily pick up this cross. Learn the habit of falling to the ground and dying. So what's he talking about? The only way I see it is dying to your own interests, dying to your comforts, dying to your things that you love in life that to consume your time, right? Jesus is saying, lay all that down. Put the other person's interests above your own and watch what comes, comes from life. That's an extremely challenging thing to do, right? If you start paying attention to your ego, it's unbelievable how often it's trying to flare up and it's in your most meaningful relationships. I would say most marriages end because of ego issues, a lot of frustrations that we have with our children are based out of ego issues. Now, they can act like turds. There's no question about it. I got two of them. But it's the ego usually that's driving my frustration and my discouragement. And then what that, those emotions do, that frustration, that discouragement, what it will do is it will cloud the voice that God has for them through you. So if I'm just operating out of this discouragement and frustration, I'm not hearing what God's wanting to do in that conversation. And what I've discovered through my time at Kinwell is most of the time, the hardest times, the hardest issues that we're going through, that's when God's wanting to communicate the most. Another thing that Jesus does here is as he's talking with her, you notice that he's speaking a little bit more directly than just spitting out facts. When we think of evangelism, when we think of discipleship, we think of, uh, I need to know the Romans road. I need to know all these things theologically. How do I explain the Trinity? Is it the egg, the apple, all this stuff? Uh, instead, Jesus speaks to the heart. He's communicating to the heart of the woman at the well. And that leads to transformation. She knew all the facts. Right? As soon as she's got a whiff of who he was, she wants to know, oh, where are we allowed to worship? Where are we supposed to go for that? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That time will come. Everyone's gonna worship together. Speak to the heart. Now, how do we speak to the heart? This has been something that's been really difficult for me to learn. I'm still trying to get better at it, is this idea of focusing on our connection to the vine, not the fruit, for the longest time, uh, and even still I struggle with it, is this idea of at, at school, I just want to make the kids like me. And I feel like that's my main job. It's like, if the kids like me, this is gonna go really well and they're gonna do everything they're supposed to, get, supposed to do. Obviously that hasn't worked out great, that mentality. So there's gotta be something else. In 2017, everything kind of hit the fan for me personally. Uh, I'd kind of reached my end. I'd been doing uh, this alternative education for five years um, and I felt like I was going to go mow grass for a living or something because I just couldn't keep doing this anymore. Uh, it got too difficult. Uh, I was focusing on trying to impress the kids and make them like me. And so that just consumed every minute, either my physical time or when I wasn't with them, my mind was on them. And therefore my wife was getting left on the side. My kids were getting left on the side and everything kind of came to a head and something had to give. Um, I didn't feel like I was supposed to quit what I was doing, but I didn't know how to keep doing it the same way. And so everything had to flip. And that's where I learned this idea of of holding on only to the branch. That's the focus. So, so often our focus wants to be on the fruit. So I want to engage with this kid. I want to take him down to Bloomington. We're going to have a great time. I hope he turns his life around and I tell him a bunch of good words of wisdom that he writes down in his little notepad of things that, great things that Roger has said to me. And we go on and have a great time. That doesn't happen, right? 
My focus should not be on the fruit, the turning around of someone else or someone understanding my perspective. That shouldn't be my focus. My focus is only to hold on to the vine, right? John 15, as I hold on to the vine, he takes care of the fruit. I don't watch the fruit that comes out on the end of the vine. I just look up here and I abide in Christ. The more I can abide in Christ, the more the fruit takes care of itself, but my worth isn't found in what fruit is being developed or not developed. My worth is only in how well am I abiding? How well am I holding on to the vine? When we do that well, then relationships flourish. Then our ego isn't as strong. Then we're hearing for God for these people and change can happen in both of us. There was a student that started with us a long time ago. And I've, if you've heard the story, forgive me because she's a uh, student still to this day. That probably means it was as close to me as any. Um, she, her name was, was Madi. And she came to us because she had fought a, uh, a, a cop in Marion High School. And uh, the first service, there was actually a student here that saw it go down. So I got more details. It was fantastic. <clears throat> but... Uh, she, she fought a, a police officer, student comes to us, and I'm expecting this giant burly woman to challenge my manhood, and instead it's this tiny little Hispanic woman that challenges my manhood. And uh, right from the beginning, things were difficult with her, right? She struggled with uh, authority. She didn't ever want to do what she was told. Uh, she was always trying to find ways to break the rules. Uh, her cousin, who she actually uh, was protecting when she fought the police officer, was also enrolled with us. And so they were quite the dynamic duo that if anything happened to one of them, the other one was stepping in with more ferocity than what was there before. Uh, so it made it a ton of fun. And so learning how to navigate Madi, I was just constantly talking about like, hey, look where this anger's taking you. I would say things are getting out of control for you. I would say these kinds of things all the time. And there was one time specifically where uh, I was kind of escorting her out the building because she caused this huge uproar. I thought we were going to have a fight. So I'm kind of walking her out. She's threatening to light my car on fire. And I was saying, no, this is, can't do this. And so I, I remember telling Madi, like, Madi, we've got to figure something out, right? Like, I'm saying stuff like this. And she turned to me and said, you don't even know me. And that hit me differently for some reason, because in my mind, I thought, no, I know what you should be doing. I know where you should be going. But she was right. I didn't know her at all. I didn't know where she had come from. Didn't know her story in any way, shape, or form. And so she came back and I started to approach her a little differently and I started bringing her on trips that we'd go on. We'd do day trips or we'd do overnight trips and I would always take Madi and I started to know her a little bit better. Over a long period of time, she started opening up more about how she had to sleep with a knife underneath her pillow to protect herself from mom's boyfriend uh, who was assaulting her in many different ways. Um, her dad was an alcoholic, mom struggled with alcohol and drugs and this was the life that she lived regularly. So as every night when she goes to sleep, she's worried about having to protect herself. And then she comes to school and I'm upset that she hasn't memorized the Pythagorean theorem. I don't even have the Pythagorean theorem memorized. So I don't know what the expectation was. But all of a sudden it makes sense. Right, life got a little bit more pers perspective. And as I start to understand Madi more and more, I started to understand the things that would motivate her, right? So we'd go on these trips and I'd see things that energized her. I would see things that frustrated her. And I, as I spent more time with her, I picked up on more of these things. Uh, there was a situation where um, a, uh, another teacher was trying to work on math with her, with a group of other students, and she got mad and stormed out of the classroom. And the teacher, we talked about it after school, and the teacher was really frustrated that she had stormed out. And, and I told him, I said, that's probably the best thing that could have happened, Right? So the next day we see her, I, I go back to approach her and she thinks she's gonna be in trouble and I got a smile on my face. And I said, Monty, I heard you didn't cuss out your teacher yesterday. That's fantastic. She goes, yeah, I guess I did. I said, yeah, this is, this is incredible. And, but I understood that for her storming out of the classroom was the best thing that could have happened in that situation. Because I've seen the worst thing that could happen. But I wouldn't have understood that if I didn't get to know Monty at that level that I knew her. And so I wonder how many people am I missing that kind of context with? Now, we're not gonna go on trips with every person and every neighbor that we have and every coworker and that kind of thing, but we can do better at asking questions. 
So many times when we disagree with people or we don't like how they act or we don't like what they think or we don't like their political views or we don't like this, that, or the other, uh, we just think about the things that we want to say to them. Anybody else stay up at night and think about things we want to tell people? I'm the only one. This is... I'll get counseling later from Pastor Emily. But we think about what we want to tell that person. Instead, what I'm wondering is maybe there's more questions we should be asking. If we enter every conversation with more curiosity, I think we'll have a different outcome. Too often we're consumed with telling our own story and talking about what we've gone through and what I've experienced. I have a son who plays travel basketball and every conversation you get with any dad who's around their son that plays sports or daughter that plays sports, they always wanna talk about their kid and what they've done, right? I always wanna say, oh, my son averaged 20 points last game or, oh, he didn't have a good game today because he got a bad ankle. Right, that's the, that's, we're all trying to promote ourselves. Jesus did something different. He just asked questions. And I wonder maybe that's our calling is to just ask more questions. Now, the story, this conversation ends with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman takes off running back to her community and she shares the great news of how she just met the Messiah. In fact, some people say like, where does she rank an all-time evangelist, right? Because this whole community comes back and meets Christ and things are different forever for her and her community. But what stood out to me also was the fact that Jesus had a different type of fulfillment as well. The disciples come to him and, and to Jesus and said, hey, we got some food, do you wanna eat? And he said, no, I've, I've got fulfillment that you know nothing about. And I thought that was really interesting. Number one, because I really like food. So if we can figure that one out, that'd be fantastic. But second, What's this fulfillment that he's experienced that the disciples who've been with him for who knows how long didn't, didn't understand? And I wonder if we're missing out on a fulfillment or a gift of God because we're too consumed with our own interests. Jesus came into this conversation with her best interest in mind, not his own, and he walked, he walked away fulfilled. I spend my time trying to fulfill myself with my comforts and I feel like I'm never fulfilled. So I'm missing something. Could it be possible that I'm too consumed with myself, too consumed with my comfort and not worried enough about the sheep that God's put around me? If I start focusing more on the beloved children that our father has put next to us, could I experience a different fulfillment? And I would say, yes, you would. Because God is wanting to talk to these people that are around us. And he's probably wanting to use you to do it. So as you focus on abiding, connecting to the vine, listen for what God's wanting to tell him. He's wanting to tell you how he feels about them. He's wanting to give you questions to ask them. He's wanting to give you answers to their questions. But if we're not spending time abiding in him, listening for what the father's communicating, we're gonna miss it completely and just live in our own unfulfillment of comfort. The purpose of every relationship that we have is to be more like Christ. Our relationship with our boss is about being more like Christ. Our relationship with our kids is about being more like Christ. With that in mind, I'd like to take a minute to reflect on two questions in closing. So first, think about who is it that you're avoiding because of comfort? Who is it that God might be asking to spend a little bit more time with? The last question 
take 60 seconds to allow God to tell you what he feels about that person. 